It was a rainy night in Cape Town, South Africa. My husband and I had just um, moved there. We had just gone there. We're both filmmakers, we're media people, and we were very much interested in being part of a developing film industry, a developing uh, media world with lots of opportunities. And so we had come to South Africa, we had come to our new apartment, we were sitting down with our takeaway food, and we thought, let's flip through the channels and get a feel for what the South African media landscape is like. So we flipped through the channels and we came across a show called um, Fear Factor and a show called Survivor South Africa. Now, as you know, um, a lot of these uh, shows like Survivor, Fear Factor and the like are replicated all over the world. The reality television programs, for example, we have Idols in America, we have the German version, Deutschland sucht den Superstar. In, um, in Germany, and basically these shows, these uh, reality shows, are based on a competition model. Either individuals or groups of people compete for a prize, and I'm trying to, there you go. Uh, they compete for a prize, be it either a record deal or money. Now in the case of uh, Survivor South Africa, um, it was two groups of people who were on an island, stranded on an island, trying to um, survive, basically stripped of all their um, basic amenities. And so my husband and I got quite comfortable, and we were expecting to see another episode of cutthroat com competition and ruthless el elimination the way we're used to seeing uh, it in other places of the world. But what happened that night on that particular episode of, of Survivor South Africa was something we didn't expect. Instead of jeering at each other, instead of putting each other down, which is usually the case, saying things like, I hope the other team loses, contestants began cheering for each other. I clearly remember one contestant running through what was something like a river, with like alligators and rocks and all kinds of obstacles, and a member of the opposite team saying, you can do it, watch out, watch out for that rock. And my husband and I did a double take, looked at each other and thought we had just landed on another planet. Now, things are different in South Africa. Clearly, we have electric fences and exotic animals and all kinds of things. But South Africa is a democracy like any other, albeit very young. And we have problems that any other democracy faces. We have short-term planning horizons and corruption and all kinds of other problems. But there is something in the South African fabric that I've come to know over the years, which I've come to call Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a word, it's a South African term, um, and it basically refers to a sense of collectivism, a sense of collective destiny, a sense of togetherness, of mutualism. I came across it again when I was working with orphans, and I wanted to understand why the concept of adoption seems so foreign to the South African fabric. The idea of adopting a child from, from its natural environment into a family and raising it in isolation to where it came from doesn't sit so well. Um, in, the, in the South African culture. And I realized that's because South Africans have this idea that um, a village raises a child, right? So if a child's parents die, an aunt, an uncle, a neighbor, someone in the village will make a plan. In fact, the village raises the child even when the parents are around. So there's a sense of collective destiny, a sense of collective responsibility. Ubuntu actually um, translated roughly means I am because we are. And this idea of I am because we are has popped up over the years, repeatedly, um, while working in South Africa. And I've really developed an image in my mind, a mental image of how this idea of Ubuntu really compares to the sort of cu cutthroat competitive culture of contest that we have in the West and that we perpetuate through our television programs. Um, this is my two and a half year old who is trying to play the piano. And when he plays the piano, he bangs on the keys very loudly. And when he plays the piano, basically each key, each note is in competition with the next. Each one is trying to stand out, each note is trying to insist on itself. And in this scenario, what happens is that you don't really hear any of the notes properly, right? Now, if a piano player is playing the piano, then you, you get this very different scenario, which reminds me of Ubuntu, where there's a sense that each note has or knows its place as part of a whole. 
where each note knows exactly when to stand out, when to shine, and when to take a back seat. And it's only in that scenario of all these different notes having this kind of interplay of unity and diversity that the true potential of each individual note actually comes into play. And we can actually appreciate the fullness of each of these different notes. Now, in what one of my favorite authors, Professor Michael Carlberg from the University of Washington calls our Western liberal societies, our Western liberal democracies, um, and our culture, we leave very little room for the sense of Ubuntu. Um, we like to play King of the Mountain. And um, this is uh, an image from the Korean parliament. Obviously, you've seen images like this in any parliament, where people are trying to compete against each other. This is the game we play. Others, uh, other people call this king of the hill. Basically, a boy is on the top, and the others are trying to push him off to win ascendancy. This is the sort of game, win-lose game, that we've set up and that we throw people in, and um, we operate on, this, on, this, uh, on these principles. Now, Professor Michael Carlberg actually says that there are three largely unconscious assumptions that inform the way we organize ourselves. These assumptions um, are what our democracies are based on, and they're what our culture of contest is based on. Um, firstly, we assume that humanity is essentially selfish, right? That we're all very selfish individuals looking out for our own good. Secondly, we're assuming that we have very different uh, interests, and that we have to organize into interest groups, and that these interest groups inherently conflict that our interests are mutually exclusive, that what I want and what you want do not go together. Um, right? Selfish nature, conflicting interests. Therefore, the only way to organize ourselves is through competition, to have a competition of ideas. The problem with these assumptions is that they came about at a time when our world looked totally different to the way it does today. Um, these ideas, these assumptions, are very Hobbesian. They originated at a time when our world was nowhere near as interconnected as it is today. We didn't have iPhones and iPads, we didn't have applications, um, we didn't have basic telephones, we didn't have planes, trains, cars. These assumptions came about at a time when our populations, our lifestyle, countries lived in relative, relative isolation to the way they do today. Obviously, there's always been interconnectivity. Our environment was nowhere near as exploited as it is today. But then our world changed. We live in a very different kind of reality today, right? We live in a highly interconnected reality. And I like to actually pinpoint it to a day. There's a day when our world changed. Um, Professor Dwayne Varon of Murdoch University in Perth pins it down to May 24th, 1844. In that week, round about um, that date, U.S. Congress had decided that they were going to close the U.S. Patent Office because they thought, look, we've probably invented everything we're ever going to invent, so maybe we should consider closing our doors. Well, on May 24, 1844, the first telegram went out. Samuel Morse sent out the first telegram, and it read, What have God wrought? And if you look at you know, technological advances that render us um, interconnected on a graph, you would see that after 1844, this graph suddenly goes up exponentially, right? So much for closing down the patent office. If you look at history, you had the wheel, the printing press, all these sporadic little things, and all of a sudden, after 1844, we just very quickly, almost overnight, 167 years, became truly interconnected. So the question becomes, in a world that is so interconnected and so interdependent, um, do those assumptions about our human nature and these things that we have chosen to inform the way we organize ourselves, do these things still hold true? Are they serving us? Is this win-lose paradigm that came about at a different time still serving us? I'd venture to say no. Now, of course, the question becomes, well, what alternative assumptions can we try out? Professor Michael Carlberg has his own ideas about that, and he suggests that while we can assume that we have selfish impulses, doubtlessly I can tell you stories of my selfish impulses, doubtlessly while they're, in, they're there, we also have a selfless side. We also have the capacity to cooperate. And we've shown that throughout history. 
It's about, do we nurture this or do we nurture the other side of our human nature? Secondly, while we doubtlessly have various different interests, do we choose to see them as being mutually exclusive? Or can we choose to see them as being complementary, like the notes on a piano? Maybe, just maybe, if we choose to see it that way, we might actually get what we want, right? Because every note gets to stand out when it sees itself as part of a whole, when it sees itself as complementary. And thirdly, if we also have a cooperative side and we can see ourselves as having complementary, if different, interests, is competition and contest really the best way to structure and organize ourselves? Or is there a different way of looking at things? When we look at our world today, um, we look at the various different environmental problems, terrorism, poverty, I would venture to say that it's worth trying out a different set of, of values, right? Because our world is very different. I mean, we even look at our economic crisis right now. I would venture to say that all these problems stem from continuing to operate on this win-lose paradigm. And I think it's probably naive and idealistic to believe that we can continue playing this game of having winners and losers and expect different results. Clearly, it's not taking us very far. Democracy, all it means is by the people, for the people. Nowhere in that definition is there anything about a competition or a contest. So as a filmmaker um, in the media industry, I ask myself, well, what do we need to, to move forward? What are the things we need to explore? And in my mind, what we need is, is a cultural evolution. You can put R in brackets for revolution, but I think it's, it's a matter of an evolution. What's the next step? And if you look at that word, it contains love in it, right? Love backwards. And I think that's very powerful. But what are the alternative messages we can put out in re reality television? There's a beautiful example of a show um, that some of you might have seen called um, Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Extreme Makeover Home Edition is a show where uh, people get together, they give of their time, they give of their resources, and they really sacrifice things in order to help a family get a home. It's a cooperative game. Now, sure, there's a network behind it, and sure, there's money involved and all, all other kinds of vested interests, but the point is, there's a shift in paradigm on this show, and it's still very in intriguing. It's just bringing out a different side, nurturing a different side of human nature. Uh, these are two signs I found. One of them is in Austria, Unbefugten Zutritt verboten. It's a bit of a harsh way of saying, you know, don't come in. And then this one was in South Africa saying, we love you, but staff only. You know, maybe it's insincere, but it's an inclusive way of saying the same thing. And until we change our language and until we change the focus of what we say, we probably can't have an effect on our culture either. One of the shows that um, is a very sort of strong win-lose show that I like to watch, guilty pleasure, is called Bridal Plasty. In Bridal Plasty, what happens is a bunch of brides compete against each other to have as many plastic surgeries as they possibly can so that they can become the, the perfect bride in the end. And I remember um, in the finale, one of the brides that was particularly vicious and had basically elbowed everybody else out and had backbitten and gossiped and cheated, she was standing up uh, for elimination. It was between her and the good bride. And uh, she, in her defense, she said, well, I didn't come here to make friends. I came here to win. And people hated her, and they voted her off the show. Now, you might find that cathartic, right, because it's fun to have the good bride win and the bad bride lose. But who's good and who's bad, right? When we set up a game to have winners and losers, and we set up a game to bring out the worst in human nature, aren't we asking for that? And what are our cameras editing together you know, to make a person look one way or the other? How about we change the game in its entirety and try and bank on people's higher nature? One of my last examples of how we can emphasize or put a microphone to um, some of our sort of more positive uh, traits is a YouTube video I saw a couple weeks ago or months ago. Um, basically, a bunch of people in New York City had put a microphone on a podium. Some of you might have seen this. And it was in the middle of New York City, and it said, 
uh, say something nice. That's all it said. So people in New York City could walk by and say something like, hey, I like your shirt, or um, it's my grandmother's birthday today, and other really nice things. And basically, what that did was it improved the general sort of environment of that part of town for a day. And it gave a focus to it, emphasized positive messages more than it did all the FUs that are probably out there anyway, right? It's just about what are we shining the cameras on? What are we focusing on? So I want to leave you with one last thought. I, um, my husband and I, we came to South Africa thinking that we could make a mark, you know, make a contribution. And really what happened over the years was that South Africa has really impacted us in the way we see things and the way we um, try and make media. And so my thought coming from a sort of more Western background is maybe we should focus less on the care packages that we send to places like Africa and the rest of the world and think more about the spiritual care packages that places like Africa and other um, countries and cultures have to offer in the process of building an ever-advancing civilization with a collective destiny so that we can move um, beyond this king of the mountain mentality that we've been subscribing to. Thank you.